This is a fight fan. Fan, short for fanatic. There's a legion just like him in the United States. Each year, he shoves his share of $90 million under the wicket for the privilege of attending places where matched pairs of men will get up on a canvas-covered platform and commit legal assault and lawful battery. What is the fascination? What does the fan look for? Competitive sport, scientific skill? Partly, but mostly he seeks action. Toe-to-toe, -to -toe body contact, physical violence, the triumph of force over force, the primitive, vicarious, visceral thrill of seeing one animal overcome another. And the basic appeal seems to center around the knockdown and the knockout, the Sunday punch, the bolo punch, the Marianne, the roundhouse right and the old one too, the rubber knees and the touch of claret. Call it blood, if you will. Somebody else's blood. Why do they do it, the fighters? Why do they practice and study so diligently the science of hammering each other unconscious with upholstered fists? Where do they come from? Sometimes they come from the ranks of stevedores and dock wallopers, and sometimes from the upper third of a college class, from a service station gas pump, or a milk company's laboratory, or a part-time job in their father's grocery store. Their primary reason for exchanging the grocery store and the garage for the gymnasium is economic. It's a living. For some, not much of a living. There are 6,000 men like these in America, professional prize fighters. Only 600 will make a living at all. And of these, only 60 will make a good living. One out of a hundred. But there's the prestige, the thrill of being the neighborhood hero, the crowd cheering for you when you're winning and booing the other boy when you're not. And there's always the great American dream, becoming the champion, best man in your division, darling of the fans and father for the sports writers. To be the champ means not just income, but wealth, not just prestige, but fame. Your name, forever inscribed in the record book along with the all-time greats. But behind the facts and figures and the columns of cold statistics in the record book are people. People the fan has never seen and seldom considers. Human beings literally fighting for a living. What must it be like to work in a prize ring? To be paid for punching and being punched? Nat Fleischer, longtime ring historian, is one who knows. Some of the names are national legends. Others are just small type on obscure sport pages. Let's take one name out of the book at random. Say, Walter Cartier. What would his story be like? This, then, is the story of a fight and of a fighter. Walter Cartier, middleweight. Today is the fight. Tonight at 10 o'clock will be one of the moments which justify his difficult life. At six o'clock in the morning of the fight begins the toughest part of being a boxer, the waiting. Walter is on the right of Vincent, his identical twin. He doesn't mind the hard training, the four miles of road work every day, as much as the waiting. Walter knows that each bout is more important than the one before, because his very livelihood depends on his improving his record each time out, and he must keep winning. Tonight is a long time off, a long time off. Through the quiet morning streets of a half-sleeping city, the two boys walk to morning mass. Walter, wearing the bow tie, is 24. 
He's a native of New York and a fighter as far back as he can remember. Walter began to do exhibition boxing with his brother Vincent when they were three years old. During the war, they fought exhibitions in the Navy where they served in the same outfit. Walter is a good fighter, but he doesn't put all his faith in his hands. It's important for him to get Holy Communion in case something should go wrong tonight. Walter's three-room apartment where he lives with his aunt, Vint serves him up a fighter's breakfast. He's a lawyer and Walter's manager. Vince lives out of town, but in the slow hours before every fight, he stays with his brother. Now they live as they used to years ago, the two boys and Walter's dog. At noon, Walter gets a complete physical examination from the Boxing Commission doctor. If he's not in perfect fighting condition, the state can call off the fight. But this doesn't trouble him. He knows he's ready. What bothers him is the waiting. And he thinks of the other boy, his opponent, who's just left here. Is he ready? Is he confident, too? Meat is vital to a boxer. It gives him the raw energy needed for fighting. A friend owns the restaurant, and he often sits proudly like this, with the boy he boasts may someday be champion. This is his second and final meal before the match. He'll fight on an empty stomach. Playing with his dog helps Walter wait out the clock back in the apartment. This little fellow is one fan who doesn't care what the record book says. He doesn't know that it's four o'clock, that six hours from now his master will have to go to work. Go to work with these same kind, playful hands. No one ever told Walter to be a fighter. His family was against it. He could have gone to work in a bean wagon or a bank or like his brother in a law office. But he picked his profession and mastered it. And these are the tools of his trade, carefully laid out now and ready to be packed. Time draws near and Walter prepares to go to the arena. Before a fight, there's always that last look in the mirror. Time to wonder what it will reflect tomorrow. The fight he's riding to now in a friend's car may bring him another rung nearer to being the best man in his weight division. It may knock him right off the ladder. He knows the odds, one in a thousand, that while he's still young, before his legs give out, he can punch his way to the middleweight championship of the world. He knows the odds, but like every good fighter, he forgets them when he reaches the arena. o'clock in a small hot dressing room under the stands, Walter moves into the last two hours of preparation. In these hours, he can feel his body tightening. 
but it's a tightness that does not come from lack of confidence. It's the pressure of the last waiting. Here in a place where the walls are so close a man can barely move his body around. If only the fight would come, then everything else would not be so bad. Not really bad at all. In another dressing room is the boy he's going to be fighting in one hour. Walter has never seen him, but he knows his record that he's been in the ring with many of the top midweights and has never been counted out. That's something to think about, not to worry about, just think about. At a time like this, it's almost as if the brothers were going into the ring together. Every blow that Walter takes is going to land on Vince too, but they don't talk about that. The last minute attentions don't take nearly enough time. There's still an awful lot left of an hour before the main event. Walter isn't concerned with the hands of the clock now, just his own hands. As he gets ready to walk out there in the arena, in front of the people, Walter is slowly becoming another man. This is the man who cannot lose, who must not lose. The hard movements of his arms and fists are different from what they were an hour ago. They belong to a fierce new person. They're part of the arena man, the fighting machine that the crowd outside has paid to see in 15 minutes. few moments are left. Coiled up now and calm, he can hear the man coming down the hall to call him. Thank you. 
one man has skillfully, violently overcome another. That's for the fan. A KO. Name of opponent, time, date, and place. That's for the record book. But it's more than that in the life of a man who literally has to fight for his very existence. For him, it's the end of a working day.